Hello friends and welcome to our virtual worship space once again. And welcome to the last Sunday of our Season of Creation series. The theme today is flourishing. We've been, uh, I've been filming in front of this fig tree over the last several weeks and maybe you've watched how it has developed, I've changed different angles each, each week, but um, it's getting pretty finished now. There are still a few figs on it. Sorry for the roaring of the car going past. Um, some of the tree's leaves are changing color, however, and we've been on a kind of, of journey as we've looked at figs over the course of this series in, um, in the light of different passages of the Old and New Testaments. Today you'll be hearing a message from another one of my reco retired colleagues who is associated with Christ Church, Pastor Kim Smith. I don't believe that I've shared a sermon from her before. Very insightful pastor and um, somebody I've known for many years. We have kids about the same age and we were young moms serving in the same circuit several years back. I think I even was at a meeting at her house once and felt her welcome. I pray that you will uh, be blessed by her message on figs. And after our threshold moment, sorry, another car is going past. After our moment of silence to uh, center ourselves, we'll be hearing another uh, hymn that has a familiar tune. I invite you to pay attention to the new words that are been matched with that song. Let us take a moment now to pause and reflect on the presence of God in our lives. The first reading for today comes from the third chapter of the prophet Zechariah, and I'm reading from the Inclusive Bible Translation. These are the words of the Yahweh Omnipotent. If you walk in my ways and keep my ordinances, you will govern my people and watch over my courts, 
and I will give you free access among those who are in attendance here. Listen, High Priest Yehoshua, you and your colleagues seated here before you are a sign that I am going to bring my servant the branch. Here is the stone which I set before Yehoshua, a cornerstone on which there are seven eyes. Look, I will engrave an inscription on it, says Yahweh Omnipotent, and in a single day I will wipe away the guilt of this land. On that day, says Yahweh God Omnipotent, you will invite each other to come and sit under your own vines and fig trees. The second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 13th chapter. Jesus told this parable. There was a fig tree growing in a vineyard. The owner came out looking for fruit on it, but didn't find any. The owner said to the vine dresser, Look here! For three years now I've come out in search of fruit on this fig tree and have found none. Cut it down. Why should it clutter up the ground? In reply, the vine dresser said, Please leave it one more year while I hoe around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then let it be cut down. Good morning. Let's, can we have slide one and then first? So I moved into my own home a few weeks ago, and this isn't the greatest picture. I, I think I need to take some picture-taking lessons on my iPhone. But the house came with this amazing fig tree. Now, I've, I've seen fig trees, and usually they're older. This one is clearly young. And the product of, are these brown turkeys or mission? They're mission? OK. I harvest more figs than you can shake a stick at. And like, um, it's an abundance. And as the previous preachers in this series, Pastor Lindsay and Pastor Nancy, have said, you know, fig trees were abundant all over the Mideast. I was able to travel to Palestine, Jordan, and Israel a number of years ago. And it's true. Lots of people sit under fig trees. And it turns out Oakmont, where I moved, is kind of like the Holy Land that way. There's lots of figs, but I've been the recipient of their figs. I have taken up canning once again after a zillion years. I had to borrow a canning pot. I gave mine away a long time ago. I share them with my figless neighbors, and I would have brought a bunch, but yesterday I made you know, a whole batch of fig compote. So um, I've been making friends with figs, even as much as puppy Lola makes friends with her outgoing self. So I've been very, very familiar with fig trees. And the fig tree is indeed, in the Gospels and in much of Scripture, a symbol, a symbol of abundance, a symbol of the fruitfulness of the land. And an symbol, a symbol not just like with a crop, you have to do a fair amount of work. Now, I know my fig tree needs some trimming back. Any experienced gardeners here to volunteer, I'll give you some figs. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, it, you don't have to do much with a tree after it, you know, is established. And there, because all crops are dry crops, at least traditionally, the figs are amazingly sweet. They're amazingly sweet. So we have this fig. So what this made me think about was that years ago, I, I served as the pastor of Trinity United Methodist Church in Berkeley, South Campus, from 1992 to the year 2010. I was there 18 years. And that was an amazing urban congregation filled with students. We started a campus ministry, a lot of unhoused people because we were in South Campus, and then the professor kind of types. Now, how many of you have ever read or heard about a religion writer called Houston Smith? One of the most famous writers in the world, and here's a picture of did a series of sermons in the fall. I asked people to submit to me words you wish Jesus had never said. 
So, you know, things like love my, your enemies and different kinds of things came in. Houston Smith, you know, published zillions of books. People came from all over the world to learn with him. We would get letters to him because they knew he came to our church. Would you please pass this on to Dr. Smith? Uh, and a lovely man, an absolutely lovely man. I have pictures of him giving a bottle to my baby, you know, and teaching her how to use chopsticks when she was three. He submitted a subject. And you know what he submitted? The scripture that Lindsay preached on two years ago about the fig tree that gets withered. And I'm thinking the world's, one of the world's most famous theologians and writers is stuck on the fig tree. <laughs> Now, I think that Lindsay and Nancy and Pastor Lori from Windsor has done a good idea about the fig trees. And I'm really glad I don't have that passage. But today is another twist on the fig metaphor because it is a metaphor for life. And we live in a place where there's figs. I can tell you in Nebraska, nobody would have gotten this metaphor in the sense of real experience. But it was so common that it would have spoken to the people of day, Jesus' day and age. And that's one of the things I love about Jesus. He speaks to the basis, you know, the most basic of our needs and through images. And it helps to contemplate one of the most, most basic tenets of our faith, that we are not in peace with God. And when we aren't, God still reaches out. We are hurt and wounded, and God heals we fall short of the glory of God, as St. Paul says, and God forgives us. We participate in systems of evil and injustice, and God shows mercy. We, okay, this is an old-fashioned word. Hang on to your seat. You might want to grab the, you know, the bottom. We sin, and God forgives. So this passage, in some ways, is symbolic of sin. And grace, as my friend calls it, the unreasonable benefit of grace. Now, in Jesus' day and age, people believe that if bad things befell you or you did bad things, you must have done something to deserve the evil. Right before the passage that Donna read, there are two examples of, of just seemingly random things that happened to people in Jesus' life. And he said, you know, this is not their fault. It is not because their father sinned or their grandmother sinned. Sin was not a punishment or bad behavior or bad things happening to us. And they believed that. They believed that. But Jesus says it's the result of bad action, your own or another. The examples he lifts up, which was Galileans who suffered, Jesus' people, or 18 people who were killed when a tower fell on them because obviously it happened, the thinking of the day would have been, because what? They had done something wrong or somebody in the past had done something wrong and they were being punished. Now, these events, a tragedy caused by a human and a natural calamity, did mean that people had done something wrong and they were being punished for whatever horrific events had happened in the past or in the present, whether they were involved or not. So clear on that, what I consider a fairly horrible concept. Well, Jesus did too. He breaks with that belief. He doesn't buy that concept of sin. He counters that prominent belief of his day that people are, these people, certain people, are not great sinners. All of us are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I don't like to use that word a lot. There's so much, can, you know, stuff, bad stuff associated with it, like negative. And I'm not saying sin isn't negative, I'm just saying there are better words for it, but I'm going to use it here. But, and all of us are need of repentance, meaning needing to look at our lives where we do fall short. Has anyone fallen short this week? Anyone uh, made a mistake? Anyone, you know, blew it up or something? And sin is not the result of what your father or mother or grandparents did but usually our own action, our own disconnection with God. Some people define sin as a broken relationship with God, with others, or with self. And in that face, here is God acts, like the gardener with the fig tree. Because this is what Jesus believes, that people 
are responsible for their own actions and selves, and God forgives. God gives a second chance. Now, this series has been about creation. And I was thinking about that in light of this ancient way of thinking about sin. And it might actually hold a little bit when it comes to climate change and what's happening to our earth, what we might call the sin of climate change. As far back as 50 to 100 years ago, grandparents and great-grandparents' generations, we were being warned about the impact of our choices around using fossil fuels, pollution, and other factors that changed the climate and health of our planet. So in a way, you and I are reaping the bad fruit of our ancestors' choices. There is a sense in which we're being punished, huh? Yeah? Yeah, we're living with the fruits of their sins, whether innocent or intentional as they might have been. I don't think anyone was intentionally going around polluting the earth, except, well, maybe a few companies, but, uh, you know, we're living with that. And if you're a boomer or above, a baby boomer, just go talk to one of your favorite or not so favorite millennials or Generation Y people. They will tell you boomers plenty about how our sinfulness of consumption and materialism and denial is leaving them a world that will not exist when they are our age. My daughter, my youngest, is 28, and she is traveling to all the places in the United States to be in nature that she believes will be eliminated in her lifetime. It's a kind of frightening thing. Because you know what? If we're to confess, are they right? They're kind of right. Have we heeded the call of the earth? Have we truly changed? And I'm, I'm, I'm standing in the need of prayer on this one too, so I'm pointing fingers. Our consumption and choices to make a difference? And how do we move forward? It feels like we're kind of stuck, huh? Well, the fig tree illustration in this story is about a second chance, about the graciousness of a God who gives us yet another opportunity. God holds us in account, but God does not judge so much as provide mercy. The parable speaks of a God with amazing forbearance whose nature is to give us the time we need to repent of our sin. That's that next season. This does, in fact, happen personally. So rather than bog down in disputes about sin and punishments, we can take our cue from the parable and speak of sin and divine forgiveness or grace because we are given the unreasonable benefit of grace. It's about the gift of fruitfulness, the grace of time, mercy. God's judgment is mercy. So we have to ask ourselves, in light of the theme of creation, what mercy is left when it comes to the condition and future of our planet? I find great hope in the teenagers I mentor at the Ceres Project. Everybody is familiar with Ceres Project, makes medically tailored meals for people in our community. And 250 high schoolers volunteer there every week to prepare and cook that food. And they deemed me crazy enough to want to be a mentor in the teenagers. So every week I go and for four hours I chop food and make food with teenagers and learn a lot about that generation. And they seem to be much more hopeful. They seem to be very clear that they can make a difference. And that's why they enjoy both technology and nature and serving their community. For them, it's a continuous circle. There's no compartmentalizing of those things. It's remarkable, and it gives me great hope. And even my own kid, who's kind of a, you know, kind of a screw when it comes to the future, has realized that there are things she can do, like she drives her gas-guzzling car, but then she buys offsets. I traveled to Scotland recently. Airplane travel is a really bad thing for the environment. So you can buy environmental offsets. And with that offset, it's not that much money, there were a thousand trees planted in Africa because I decided to do that. Well, I kind of got bludgeoned into it by my kid. Okay, <laughs> I would have done it anyway. So the story's about hope. The plant in this parable isn't producing. It's hopeless. 
Would most of you take that out of your garden after three years? If my, my little figgy bush there, who this year is just like having so many babies, I don't know what to do with them, ever stops producing, do I think I would keep it there in the prominent spot in the garden? What do you all think, you farmers? You'd keep it? Yeah? Oh, you're the, you're the most lousy farmers I've ever known. <laughs> So it's not about the tree, it's not about the gardener, it's about God, who even in times of hopelessness is present and so is hope. So we can ask ourselves simple questions. How are we living and acting in grace with the healing of the earth? Do we really need to take that car trip? Can we walk? Can we wait? Do I really need to just order one small box of whatever from Amazon? Can I wait? Can I actually go to a store when I'm making lots of errands? How about those offsets that we can do so that we at least offset the damage we personally are doing? And in what ways is God turning over the soil, watering and feeding the plants in your life and in our community? And what practices do we have that contribute to the health rather than the demise of our planet? I was just absolutely delighted when the smart train, which you know has its purpose, it's kind of limited, but it's, it's free for students and seniors. You can go for free and you can, re and, you know, it's like, I mean, it's a marvelous thing. So you go and park and you get on and you can listen to music, it has great Wi-Fi. They used to have a cocktail hour some weeks, but they, that didn't happen anymore. Anyway, smart train is something like a second chance God is offering us. And that's grace. I take heart in the words of Michael Schuller. A sustainable future is conceivable and more probable if we can manage to instill in people a deeper sense of gratitude. In the final analysis, sustainability is as much spiritual as a practice matter because it requires both a thorough reorientation of our relationship to the world Nancy spoke about this last week so beautifully, and a radical revision of certain assumptions we have made about a good and meaningful life. So what makes for a good and meaningful life? How do we live in that grace which produces extraordinary gratitude? Now, you're gonna just see a video here, not of Houston, but of a teenage boy who's just had his wisdom teeth out, okay? So he's a little loopy, and you, I don't know if you'll get the connection, and Robin has to cut it off right after a certain line because then the ad that is next, it's on YouTube, is kind of not church appropriate. Um, so this, I believe, is one of the greatest illustrations of profound gratitude, aided by a few dental drugs that I have ever heard. Here, here is the video. Remember, he just had his wisdom. Uh, is that a nice chair? Yeah. Yeah, is it better than the one you have at home? I have a chair at home? Yeah, you have a chair at I home. I have a chair for myself? Yeah. No way. Remember, Mom and Dad bought it for you. I have a mom? <laughs> oh, my God. Do you know who I am? Yeah. Who am I? <laughs> I'm your dad. <laughs> Two sisters, too. Oh, really? yeah. oh my God! Where are they? Well, they're at work. Oh they gotta God! Work. I can't believe I have sisters. And you have a dog. Oh my God! Isn't that cool? Oh my God. He's a big dog. Oh my God! I love big dog. Do you remember his name? No. What's his name? His name is Bane. Oh my God! You're playing Batman! Oh my god! God! Oh my god, my life is perfect. My life is perfect. Isn't that the best expression of gratitude unleashed you have ever seen? My life is perfect. You know, the concept of enough, Dayenu, that Lindsay spoke of, it would have been enough. It is enough. 
And we have that, and we are asked to share of that in ways that makes it possible for others, through justice and through the grace that God offers us. Because, as Paul Hawkins says, healing the wounds of the earth and its people does not require saintliness or a political party, only gumption and persistence. It's not a liberal or a conservative action. It is a sacred act. This is the sacred act we are called when we sit under the fig tree. Amen.